right, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to have you and to welcome you to this um, program by artist Aaron Rafino. I'm Maria Ferguson. I'm the collections curator at the Roger Tory Peterson Institute. For those of you who haven't yet visited RTPI, we're located in Jamestown, New York, which is the birthplace of Roger Tory Peterson, the father of the modern field guide. So here at RTPI, we are home to the largest collection of Roger Tory Peterson's work and archives. And we aim to be a living embodiment of the Peterson Field Guides. So we also aim to nurture the next generation of nature artists, and which is why we're so excited to have artist Erin Rafino with us today. So today, Erin is going to discuss her mural in the RTPI Art and Nature Lab, telling us how the development and design were informed by her inspiration from Roger Tory Peterson. With a narrative that describes Peterson's role as a bridge between the shotgun and the binoculars in bird watching, her mural emphasizes the revolutionary role of the Peterson field guides. Erin is a freelance artist and muralist based in Fredonia, New York, where she graduated from SUNY Fredonia with a BFA specializing in drawing and painting. Her work has been included in both regional and national exhibitions, including most recently the Salon de Refuse at the Wausau Museum of Contemporary Art in Wisconsin and the 64th Society of Illustrators annual exhibition in New York City, which she'll tell us about. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Erin. Thanks, Maria. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. And I'm excited to share a little bit about my process of creating the Flickr moment here. So I'd be remiss not to start by thanking my dad, Chuck Rafino, who not only painted the mural alongside me every single day, but who took my sisters and I to RTPI growing up as co-director um, with teacher Lynn Leakey through their nonprofit arts and science organization, Great Lake FX. They encouraged the study of nature using Peterson's field guides. And these guides were really my first introduction to the concept of research itself. They showed us how to use the index to look up page numbers of birds or bugs or wildflowers or whatever the subject was. And then once we found the right pages, we'd read and write out short descriptive facts about the species. And of course, we'd study the illustrations to look at the color and shape differences between the species of animals and plants. So here is a giant floating ladybug I did at age seven using um, Roger's insects guidebook as a leaping off point. And at the start of the mural, I found out that my dad would actually, as a child, copy pages of Peterson's field guides. And he still has a sketchbook full of colored pencil drawings um, from when he was around 15. So it's extra special to have painted the mural with him, being that he grew up with Peterson and now he's passed on the same appreciation to me and um, my sisters and anyone else who has been in the program. And one highlight of many throughout the entire mural process is hearing just how many people, both artists and non-artists alike, have had such impactful experiences with Peterson's work as children or young adults and how the work continues to follow them throughout their lives. So in case anyone hasn't made it out to the Institute, this is the mural and we'll be talking about it today. So because this mural was so heavily inspired by um, Roger's field guides, I thought we'd start by first covering the importance of a good silhouette. Silhouettes are the images of a person, thing, or scene filled in with one solid color to represent the overall outline of a form. So this was originally formatted for an in-person lecture. So I guess just quietly guess to yourselves about what you think this shape represents. I'll give you a couple seconds. Promise it's something. Okay, let's find out what it is. It is a duck from above. So why doesn't this shape read as a duck? And when we're talking about readability of a shape and illustration, we're talking about clarity of information. At Visual Arts Passage, the online academy where I've studied, they stress the importance of creating shapes that describe themselves well. And designing a strong silhouette means the viewer should be able to quickly identify what the shape represents. While this might make for an interesting photograph, it's, it, this blob doesn't work for a field guide illustration since most of us view ducks from the side. Therefore, the silhouette doesn't present us with any of a duck's distinguishing features. There's not much of a tail, you don't see any of the wings or feathers, and only a nub of the bill which only becomes apparent after you've seen the original reference photograph. 
So this shape doesn't immediately look like an animal, let alone a duck. So here are two much better examples of silhouettes where the most important duck features are shown from an appropriate view and with accuracy. These have an attention to detail that elevates them from representing any old duck to more specifically a mallard. And if placed in the proper context of Rogers Field Guides, the silhouettes would allow experienced birders and newbies alike to quickly identify them at a glance, making it critical for observation in the field. So these two silhouettes make this first blob look pretty pathetic. <laughs> and while it might not, oh, sorry, while it might seem obvious not to draw a duck from above, the philosophy to draw simply and to draw clearly becomes exponentially more important once narrative and meaning weaves in. And if you happen to stop into the Institute by July 17th, you can see these exact um, duck plate illustrations hanging up for the Art of the Field Guide exhibition. So with designing clear shapes in mind, how did we get here? The spark to adapt Roger's Field Guide initially came when I was assigned a historical portrait and I was bouncing between four choices. Roger, a film director, a French pirate, or an Australian bush ranger. But because I had grown up visiting the Institute, Roger went out. So these are my initial notes here and um, a page of thumbnail ideas. 2A and 2B depict Roger as a teenager based off a photograph I saw during the Life, the Work, and the Legacy exhibition back in 2018 when I was visiting for my 21st birthday. 3A and 3B show a more famous photo of Roger um, holding binoculars and there's a scene of birds and in a landscape within the binoculars. And then four shows his old box camera with some northern flickers hanging around and a tiny portrait of Roger in the lens. And then the idea that ended up in the mural is one and it depicts Roger in his own illustration. So the basis of the idea is Roger's roadside silhouette illustration found on the inside cover of his Birds of Eastern and Central North America field guide, and it labels 28 common birds for quick identification. So growing up, we had multiple copies of this field guide around the house as well as in the car and always with some binoculars nearby. So besides the accuracy of the birds themselves, another great strength is that Roger provided us with a broader sense of scale. Birds aren't floating neatly on a blank background with only each other to compare sizes against, whether they're sitting on tower lines in the tree, perching on the fence posts, or slinking around in the brush. The interactions say something about the behavior of the birds too, and it goes beyond simply depicting what subjects look like and starts to reveal details about their character. And going back to the power of a silhouette, we don't need to see each grain to know these are distressed wooden fence posts. You don't need to see the gleam of metal or flakes of rust to understand these are strands of barbed wire. You don't need the color green to tell this is grass down here. And I doubt anyone is mistaking these lines for odd tree branches. So even without a utility pole, we can understand that these are power lines. And that's all coming from the silhouette alone. And I like to think of silhouettes as shorthand based on our everyday experiences and knowledge. So I thought this photo here was a pretty perfect representation of Roger's peaceful and sympathetic methodology. I flipped the image to settle him underneath the tree and turned all of the bird's heads as if they're watching him draw. So here's a black and white version of the mural overlaid on top of the original field guide. So you can see that not much changed from the original to the mural, but if there are any birders here who <laughs> spot discrepancies, please save your critiques for my dad because he's the one who painted in the silhouettes. I can say that because he's not in the Zoom. Nobody tell me. <laughs> so illustration requires visual communication to solve client problems. Just like your shapes need to be clear, your goals need to be too. So my objectives with this mural design were to first and most importantly, tell an aspect of Roger's legacy by comparing old versus new studying techniques. And since Roger was nearly always seen and photographed with binoculars, I wanted to use their recognizable shape as a focal point. And of course I had to include the very bird that's 
sparked his lifelong interest in the Northern Flicker. Second, my plan to engage families was to depict Roger as a child in a heroic action pose. And third, to promote further curiosity about Roger's life, include references to the non-invasive tools he used to study nature. So with my objectives and research laid out, I started sketching. There was so much potential imagery to pull from because of Roger's rich history of adventuring and activism and of course painting. Um, these first ideas were sketched out very quickly and they included a giant portrait of Roger with some half-finished binoculars, um, birds flying out of his box camera, feathers creating a tidal wave of change here. But fortunately for all of us, I abandoned those ideas. So while viewing, um, Alberto's Ray's, Alberto Ray's Extinct Bird Project at the Institute back in 2019, I was most surprised to learn how destructive early shoot and capture technique, techniques were and how specimen collecting practices directly contributed to the demise of several species of birds. It illuminated how Roger really was the one who revolutionized studying birds by patiently watching and waiting instead of shooting them down. So I found my footing in his quote that he considered himself to have been the bridge between the shotgun and the binoculars in bird watching. Before he came along, the primary way to observe birds was to shoot them down and stuff them. So first, my linear approach to creating a visual narrative out of this quote was shotgun, bridge, binoculars, and bird. And then came the connection that bridges and binoculars already sort of look alike. So I sketched a binocular bridge right here and right here with the young Roger standing on top based off of this photograph of him as a child holding his trusty bug net. So with the shotgun representing the old and the binoculars representing the new, it was an easy decision that from left to right, the mural needed to transition from antiquated to modern conservation techniques, but I couldn't paint a giant gun on the wall that would have been pretty grisly for an educational family space. So I first attempted drawing netting. You can see in these two sketches with these kind of parallel lines here, but I felt that was too visually fragile for the severe harm directly caused in Audubon's era. And I didn't want netting to be confused with the safe mist nets researchers use for bird banding. So I had to move on to the metaphor of a vintage bird cage and then relating back to Roger's interest in birds being first ignited when he discovered a northern flicker as a child, I decided a young Roger should charge forward, actively breaking the bars of the cage instead of just standing on top. And the sketches on this page show him holding his bug net as seen in the previous slides photo, but that didn't really have anything to do with bugs. So I changed it eventually to his um, digital camera. And then I took a lot of inspiration from Roger's pose from this really not well-known artist named Norman Rothoff. Just kidding. <laughs> He's regarded as the father of American illustration. And this is my inspiration page that I put together when coming up with ideas for his pose. And um, these are a lot from the Saturday evening post covers that Rockwell did. And um, Though it's embarrassing, part of being an artist is having to take photos of yourself when no one's around to model for you. So I turned on my phone's video, grabbed a pair of binoculars, got up on a lawn chair, and had to move around to get a feel for Roger's pose and get the right perspective of looking up. So this GIF at the bottom here shows um, the transition from a rough digital sketch to a more finished black and white sketch here, a value study, and then the refined color study and the final painted mural. I filled the bird cage with five extinct bird specimens, several of which the Institute has in their special collections, and that I was lucky enough to see some during the extinct birds project. Um, the specimens are a passenger pigeon, a dusky seaside sparrow, a black mamo, a Bachman's warbler, and a Carolina parakeet. And I filled the cage with dead birds rather than living ones, again, to properly reflect how destructive early studying techniques were. And they all have specimen tags labeling the year they were declared extinct. And in 
here, the difference is that I brought down the edge of the cage in front of the binoculars. So the binoculars are more obviously a bridge leading out of the cage. Um, from here, I also developed the flicker itself. Naturally, they have yellow on their wing feathers, but to more accurately represent how positive Roger's legacy is, I painted the entire flicker yellow as a guiding luminous force carrying his momentum into a new era. And then even with the adapted roadside silhouette illustration on the right hand side, I still had room for another layer of the story. So I added a world map as a backdrop behind the roadside silhouette illustration, hinting at Roger's ideas spreading across the globe like leaves spreading across the silhouette tree. Then it was a matter of adding Easter egg references, mostly to the tools Roger used for studying, his binoculars and digital camera, his old box camera, um, the gun stock that he mounted onto a movie camera, or vice versa, the movie camera he mounted on the gun stock, and his sketchbook and journals. Um, near the end of the painting process, my dad and I added a little flicker feather on the world map to show um, like a you are here marker for the institutes. I have a detailed picture of that later on. So here's my sheet of color studies. And I did these in Photoshop, playing with warm and cool color interactions as the mural transitioned from left to right. I ultimately went with a combination of 11 and 9. Um, I thought those suited the arts and crafts kind of style of the building, of the institute with its warm yellows and greens, as well as orangey wood tones. And then because you can't purchase a million gallons of paint, I like to first make a color map to help me decide what the major colors are and what I can mix from the other colors that I buy. So for quarts of paint, I think we ended up with having six big ones with the, the teal of the background with the specimens, the minty green for the map and the orange, a rich chocolatey brown, I think two yellows for the flicker. And um, because of, it's a large area to cover for, mur for murals, I generally like to use exterior acrylic house paint because it's durable. And usually you tend to buy more saturated colors than what you need because when you start mixing house paint, they get very dull quickly. So it's better to start with too much saturation than too little because you can always dull out a color by adding its complement or the opposite color on the color wheel, but you, it's harder to inject saturation back into a color once you've lost it. So once the ideation and designing is done, you actually have to make the thing. So for murals, I find um, using a projector is the quickest and most accurate method of transferring the design onto the wall. So in the back of the Art and Nature Lab, I had my computer hooked up to the projector and we shot it on the wall. That's me sitting in front of it. So after the design was sketched onto the wall in pencil, I block in the largest areas of color. And there's a lot of trial and error in this stage, getting the right colors, because every color decision you make depends on the color decision you made right before it. So if this is starting to look too blue, it may be because the color next to it is, isn't quite right yet. So as you can see here, it took quite a few tries to get the right gray, brown, green for the specimens. So um, it's a large wall, so a lot of time was spent building up color in multiple layers. Um, acrylic paint tends to dry darker than what it looks like when it's wet. So there's a good amount of adjusting you have to do and you have to step back frequently throughout the day to make sure everything is cohesive and reading as a whole. And plus you have to remember that most people are going to see the mural from afar, several feet away, and not the up close distance that you're painting at. The part that takes the longest in the process is detailing and texture. Because you're working with smaller brushes and being more precise, you're adding shading and light effects, you're outlining, and overall you're just making sure that every brush stroke is taking you one step closer to the finish line. So in this stage, there's no more, I'll fix that later. It's, it's later, so you have to fix it then. Um, and I was taught that while the overall impact of a picture is critical, it's also very important to reward viewers um, when they come up close 
to provide um, by providing texture and details. It helps the audience slow down and explore the image, perhaps inviting them to see things that they might have otherwise missed um, if they only viewed the mural from the back of the room. So for example, the specimen tags from afar, you can like kind of see that there's something written on them, but we specifically chose not to make the writing too legible so that you're forced to go up close and to be able to read the name of the bird and the year they were declared extinct. So here are some up close um, detail shots of the, the different studying tools. Here's the little flicker feather that's right above the big yellow flicker on the map as a little you are here marker. An example of the specimen tags. One of his journals next to him is the roadside silhouette illustration. This is the movie camera, box camera and his binoculars. So what made Roger Troy Peterson so revolutionary compared to his naturalist predecessors was that he traded the barrel of a shotgun for the barrel of a long lens. Since the mural's home is the art and nature lab, it's my hope that children and the children inside all of us will see a reflection of themselves in young Mr. Peterson and you admiring wildlife as a lifelong adventure. And then I was incredibly excited that among thousands of entries, the Flickr Moment Mural was accepted into the 64th Society of Illustrators Annual Art Competition and a print of the mural hung in their New York City gallery back in January and photographs in a project description will be featured in their hardcover catalog published later this year. So thank you all so much for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Erin. And it's it's so wonderful to hear you talk about your mural and um, especially it's um, just the amazing amount of work that you put into it and not just painting it, but the process of the concept development and the design development um, is really amazing. So do you have an idea of about how long that whole process took? The concepting part? Um, well, the Institute put out the call for muralists, I think back in April. And I only saw the call for muralists about a week before the deadline. So most of the week was actually spent updating my resume and things like that. Um, so I think I, for some reason, my brain tends to work better in writing first. So I started by taking a day to write out the narrative of the mural and what I wanted to convey. That was kind of what um, my objective slide was about. So that took about a day and then once I was, you know, notified that I was a finalist in the call for muralist, designing it took like two or three weeks, I think, to get everything up to snuff, to make sure all the details were correct and going back through the old photos of Roger to get the right shoes and the right hat and all of that. So. It's an amazing amount of research so, and, and we appreciate the final result. So we have another question for you. Do you feel that doing this project and all that you've learned will influence your future choices and direction as an artist? Oh, absolutely. I think it mostly rekindled my appreciation for wildlife art. I had been doing mostly figurative work up until this point, but I think being able to like reconnect with my childhood and my dad and going back through and remembering, the, oh, I grew up, you know, studying Peterson's field guides and growing up exploring and appreciating the outdoors, I think it will definitely send me back outside more to appreciate you know, what's around me and to like remind me to be curious about everything. That's wonderful. And I think that your mural will have the same effect for visitors that it will encourage them to be curious. Um, so, and you know, I just love um, hearing you talk about your mural and especially the part about seeing, um, thinking about the bridge and the binoculars and, and seeing the similarities and it just takes an artist to kind of make that visual connection. So that's always fantastic. Um, so uh, just to um, let everyone know, as Erin mentioned, the Art of the Field Guide is on view here at RTPI until um, the 17th, which is this Sunday. Um, so you have a little less than a week to come see it. 
And um, after that, we'll take a little bit of time to change our exhibition. And then starting July 27th, we will open Art That Matters to the Planet. So this will be an exhibition of 15 nature artists from um, an international, it's mostly national, one international artist, um, where we're, we're really looking at their artistic practices and thinking about the way that they consider the relationship of their work to nature um, and how they want to um, give viewers messages about um, the way that we can engage with nature and, and think about ourselves in relation to nature. Um, so we're really excited to have that exhibition up and the opening event will be July 29th. We hope to see you there. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you Erin again for this amazing presentation. My pleasure. Thank you.